All right, welcome folks. Today, an exciting topic led again by Dimitri. I'm loving the working title for this of, is there an article for that? Because this comes up so much when it comes to talking with other behavior analysts, social media, whatever. So where did this come from? Uh, so we first, last week we talked about setting up a, a topic for translational research because that seems to be a thing that people talk about and want. And honestly, up until I took a translational course, I, I didn't realize I had no understanding of it. Actually, <clears throat> I had a total misconception of what it was. So it clarified that for me. And I figured if not to sound, this is going to sound really arrogant, but like it, I didn't know what it was. And I, I think I know a lot of shit. So like, I was like, well, maybe a lot of people don't know. Maybe it'd be a good information piece for people to have a, have out there. And then as I was like writing out the outline for it, you know, I saw a colleague that I know post a thing on the social media and then it, it kind of dawned on me a, a thing that kind of doesn't bother me per se, but I think it's, pro it's a thing that requires conversation, which is like everybody wants an article for something for everything <clears throat> and uh in lieu of our skinner talk and reaction video in terms of first principles and all that stuff i thought it'd be a good uh a good way to go through it so i want to go through what kind of research there is what does what, what what role does research play what's our responsibility to it what's its responsibility to us and how do we <laughs> use it and kind of see where that discussion takes us i guess so i do have a canned i like the idea of starting with these canned um opening paragraphs where well, i'm just going to read it here uh because i feel like it helps me focus and uh, honestly keeps my mouth clean folks because honestly <laughs> I, I have a dirty mouth and i'm trying to clean it up a little bit <clears throat> for the podcast uh and for the listeners out there so um is there an article for that so i guess let's set the stage for what what's the problem that we're trying to solve what's the discussion about so research is more than just a component of operating as a behavior analyst the literature base is the rock that underpins our foundation i mean it's it's the peter of our church right it is it is what we are built on because we are empiricists however despite best efforts we have arrived at a place where the field has substantively divided between the scientist and the practitioner and we talk about that all the time there's a divide the chasm between those that produce the literature and those that consume it is wide and has created some serious issues of functionality, usefulness, and understanding. <clears throat> First, the question is of access. How can one engage in evidence-based practice if we don't have access to publications? Second, accessibility. How can one engage in evidence-based practice if they don't understand what they're reading? Thirdly, usefulness. What can we do with research on hissing cockroaches or on Puerto Rican sex workers or on any other type of topic that doesn't seem to have a contextual basis if, if we can't necessarily relate it to other things? So the real question is, do we need explicit research for everything? How do we reconcile this stuff? What is the reality of navigating this distinction and what is what, what are the requirements of a, some basic understanding between what kinds of research exists categorically, what function it serves, and what is the parameters for which we will use it? So that's, that's, the, that's the topic of conversation. Welcome to the two-day-long episode on, on research. <laughs> no. This is this is awesome, man. There's going to be so much here. Um, uh, it is it is going to be huge, I think. But I mean, here's the deal, though. Like, it's needed, man. We have to have this conversation because, like, again, you know, we set out in the podcast to like inform people through comedy and through like hyperbole and ridiculousness and informality, and it kind of deteriorated into a shock jock routine. And that was not what I want to be, man. I don't want to be like <laughs> Carl Binder said. You remind me of the Howard Stern of behavior analysis, and I was like, what the fuck? That is not. <laughs> what i was going for dude like i know that i'm like intense person and i was just kind of being myself to the extreme or whatever but really it's about like trying to clean up some of the thinking and again this could you know that kind of statement could make people say well like whose thinking matters dimitri are you saying that the people need to think like you and no that's not necessarily the case but i think that like having an informed discussion and maybe just putting it out there and let people at least have one aspect of the conversation or one, one point of view that they can dissect and kind of integrate into their own thoughts about it matters. Um, for sure. So, and so where do you want to, where do you want to start on this? Doing. So let's, let's start with, you know, some other reasons why this is so like, 
or, or, or what are the, the pre, presuppositions or operating assumptions that we have for our argument? Number one is we have to use evidence-based practice. Aside from it being our ethical obligation, it's our obligation as empiricists, as scientists, as people who base their what they do on facts. Secondly, we have an obligation to stay current on the cutting-edge stuff. So, like, we have to know what's the latest and greatest because science changes, data points change, variables change, discoveries occur. <clears throat> Third, we talk about the practitioner-scientist model, but then all the discussions and all the realities of that are not the case. There is a divide between the practitioner and the scientist. Again, even back to what Skinner was talking about in his APA address when he was talking about psychology and what led to the great schism of cognitivism was that divide between the practitioner and the science itself. And then fourthly is a basic pragmatic question. You need it to be good. (laughs) <laughs> like, if you want to be effective, if you want to be good, you have to know what you're doing is rooted in evidence and has to be rooted in the literature and the research. So those are some of the underlying assumptions that we're operating under. Cool. Which those assumptions we can circle back to later. Um, but each of those could be discussed as to, like, how well is our current infrastructure actually orienting people to those training those uh, you know what i mean yeah and i think that like <laughs> this is the, there's this is a holistic conversation you know so it's going to go in a bunch of different directions I, it's I, there's a lot of setup going on to this episode because we have to yeah. there's a lot this is a pretty complicated co- topic so like you have to set it up properly otherwise it's it can deteriorate into a, a, a blubbering mess pretty quickly so, <laughs> yeah i'll circle back around to those yeah um so let's just so let's let's talk about what what is research and what kind of research is out there, like categories first, so that people can, again, you probably know this already, but let's just talk about it briefly. <clears throat> so research is just, research is bu- peer-reviewed publication, typically, not necessarily published, though. Um, it's experimentation, run through the experimental, uh, the scientific process, documenting and demonstrating or outlining particular results. The way that we would talk about in terms of the literature base, that specifically means peer-reviewed published research in a journal. Yeah. Okay. So what kinds of research is out there? Well, traditionally, and and from my understanding, there's really three primary categories. I'm sure there's a variety of others across disciplines, but in, in behavior analysis, you have the applied, you have experimental, and you have translational. So, um, I think a lot of people think they understand what those things are, but let's talk about those briefly. So what's applied research? Applied research is the everyday, day-to-day documentation and, and, and practice um, being recorded in terms of an experiment. So you have some controls in like the regular natural environment of, of practice or clinical exercise, and you organize it in such a way uh, where you can try to demonstrate experimental control. You apply intervention. You may do a withdrawal. You may do some type of design and voila you have applied research <clears throat> it's already b- which, it's based on a procedure typically which on a side note like that whole aba therapy to anybody that's relatively new in the field there's a bit of a misnomer there because uh technically that applied focuses on social significance and like really focusing on measuring these sort of things right but oftentimes that aba therapy is um, really just the practice of like delivering things and not so much of that measurement process, I would say. Oh, my God. You know what? Th- thanks for bringing that up, man, because I actually didn't write down the notion of measurement. That's that's the key part of the research, too. Right. And the key part of being a behavior analyst is measurement. Like what we're talking about is measuring things in such a way as to demonstrate control, experimental control. <clears throat> um, OK, so then you have experimental research. Now, experimental analysis of behavior, experimental research is is seems like, well, isn't it all experimental? It it actually means categorically a particular thing. It means basic research. It's basically like the equivalent of physics would be like testing for gravity and finding first principles. This is like mostly typically animal research, even though I guess you could have experimental research on humans, but that would probably be called eugenics. So you don't want to be doing that. (laughs) I mean, there is is some basic human operant labs that are still in the field. Um, Yeah, uh, so the one that... And don't quote me as like this is happening within the last couple of years because I haven't been in touch with it, but it's always been going on. Was always a little bit of human operant work going on in uh, Linda Hayes's graduate student lab at the University of Nevada Reno. I know this from like firsthand being accidentally in one of them <laughs> as like an undergrad signing up. Um, but also when I was there throughout my undergrad, like they were still running some things. And I know some folks still kind of work on that. Um, I would say similar topics. She approaches approaches it differently, but yeah, you can think about um, things that have to do with perception or language. Um, 
that are human specific, at least I'm using loose air quotes here, um, categories of behavior that they were studying. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, there was, I think for sure it was experimental. Um, the thing here is it's, uh, on the complete opposite side of the, the crazy human research that, that people have done, right? Like this is just going through computer tasks, tapping some arrows, you know, like nothing. Yeah. 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 Nothing gotcha, gotcha. Decision making, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. And then there's translational research. The, uh, the new hot, hot word that seems, I just wish there was more translational research. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I, you know what, and the re this is part of what sparked this. I was that guy too. I'm like, ah, I'm so sick of like token economies and reinforcement systems and what I read or like functional analysis, uh, uh, or then like I, or animal research from EAB, which is like, what the fuck am I reading? Hissing cockroaches have nothing to do with what I'm taught. Like, uh, um, but translational research isn't necessarily what we think it means. Right. Translational research is this like idea of applying first principles to a new i new a, to a new population in a new way it's taking what comes out of eab typically and producing uh, a new application for it across settings pr uh, populations etc now the key thing here though is that that is the conventional understanding of it but that's not really what it means right that's how people perceive it to be. What it really means is just like going either way. It's bi-directional. Applied research should also inform experimental analysis of behavior. Well, experimental analysis of behavior should inform applied research. It should be bi-directional. <clears throat> and I think that that misunderstanding <sighs> really frames a pretty significant problem in terms of how we look to contact research, how we view its role in what we do, and w w how, it, how we... How we actually make the general groundswell in the zeitgeist in terms of like what is necessary and what is what is asked for from those who do research for us to actually be able to do the work that we do. Um, so let's talk about translational research a little bit more here. Uh, do you have any experience with translational research? Mm, I would say, I don't know. Let me describe two scenarios that come to mind and, and then you help me through this. Okay. So the first one, uh, my thesis was trying to attempt to take some sort of understanding of what was being done in teaching perspective taking and understanding it from a relational frame theory perspective and actually teaching the skill. But rather than just taking something that had been done um, in like a basic research setting, I was trying to bring it into a more novel setting in like a preschool and uh, applying it not through like a one-on-one -on -one procedure, but uh, essentially assessing, can you do the same thing with a computer-based application of it? And so I, I would, don't know- I call that translational. I don't know if that necessarily constitutes, but like that was the first thing that came to mind. Um, Had it been which, done before that way? No. Yeah, dude, I would say that's translational. If it was, it wasn't in the documented research. I mean, I don't want to discredit anyone that's doing some cool stuff out there. Um, but the or to your best to your knowledge right yeah um but then the other one was which i think falls down into a pretty a, a little bit harder of an example um i had a a buddy in the research lab that was looking at the effects of uh caffeine on fish <laughs> goldfish um which is one of those things that uh <clears throat> doesn't seem immediately applicable to anything, right? Um, but what was cool is that was actually a gap in the research. And what was even more interesting is that it was having the opposite effect that it has on us. It actually abated behavior instead of uh, um, evoking um, or altering the response rates in that sort of way. So it was one of those like, oh, different finding. Um, and it had a dual purpose of also this person wanted to get into um, experimental research. And so really it was a stepping stone for that. It kind of like hit both of those. Um, I mean, yeah. basically, so he proved that fish ha actually do have ADHD. <laughs> 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 so the stimulant chilled him out. Good job. Fascinating, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. Um, That's like that hissing cockroaches thing. I was referring to this... Uh, this Dixon article, this Dixon study that they published on hissing cockroaches and decision making, and basically they proved that uh, cockroaches have a preference between certain kinds of foods. And like, <laughs> I'm reading this and I'm like, well, don't all organisms have a preference for foods depending on how hungry they are and what's available to them? Like, the, I don't, what, whatever. Um, so yeah, so 
yeah, I believe that those are both translational for sure. It's not like pure like discovery research because experimental research in my mind is like stuff that occurs in a lab and is like discovery research. Like it has no, it's just like, Hey, we're just doing this thing and whatever comes from it. Merry Christmas. Happy new year. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Fail, good, bad, ugly success, whatever. There is no, there is no such thing. It's just measurement, measure, measure, measure. So those are the three pr- kinds of research that we typically contact as practitioners in the field um, etc. So like, when should you go to the literature base? Well, let me ask you this question, man. When do you go to the literature base? When I have absolutely no clue where to start is like a good signal for me that I need to schedule in a good chunk of time. I'm talking about at least an hour, probably more like two to three hours, um, that I'm going to like really try to, to search far and wide for as many things as I can. Um, that's probably, I guess, what's developed over like 10 years of being in the field as like this realization of like, if I don't understand even where to start that I need to throw a lot of time out of it. Um, I guess there's a sense of, I go to the research when I have a question that I think I can answer pretty relatively quickly. Um, and it's like, again, a gap, but it's something that I know where to start. So it's like, I know what journal to maybe start looking in to get a, a lead. I kind of, I'm realizing that it's kind of, if I don't have a lead on where to start, so there's not a book, a reference, an article somewhere that's related to the thing that I'm trying to discuss or whatever, then I I, I need to find that. And that takes a lot of time to find that initial article um, or, or or piece, right? But if I know where to start, then it's it's a lot quicker. And that's something that I can just go... Um, I don't know. I've slowly do you do, do, you do see because like one of the things I was thinking is that like because when I was trying to like what I was trying to do here is deconstruct my own process here so I could just talk about how I do it too and like maybe like show people like hey this is what I do if this works for you good luck to you. <coughs> and like I think that I usually go I'll do some research or I'll do some like checking and stuff if it's like an area that I've never heard of or I have no idea how to do um, but before I even do that usually I'll do like thought experimenting. Like I'll sit down and do like, I'll just visualize the problem a little bit and really think on it. Like I I'll dedicate some time and I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this like rain man, you know, beautiful mind scenario, (laughs) sit down and actually engage in some thought experimentation and, uh, play it out a little bit across of like, okay, if I do this, what does it look like? If we do this, what does it look like? Um, does it relate to this notion? Does it not? And then usually that'll give me my springboard before I even get to the point where I start searching. But even then, if I'm being totally honest, I rarely, rarely go straight to the literature base for stuff. I usually just go, I usually default to the most base position and then build from there. Uh, m- but mostly because I don't do anything that really is that out of, out of, outside of my scope or new to me. Most of the time, if I'm digging the literature, it's because it's like, holy shit, I don't know. Like critical thinking, for example, like we were talking about critical thinking and like, I have mm-hmm. a lot of experience in, in like formal logic, symbolic logic and, and argument deconstruction, but in terms of like teaching critical thinking skills and how do you go about doing that or even just like what's the behavioral explanation for critical thinking fucking no clue like i had to like as a matter of fact i had to have a professor send me like a entire lit review of stuff with like 20 30 articles because i'm just like listen even as i look this stuff up i'm not getting what i need like i'm a moron help me you know what i mean i need an adult (laughs) you know what i mean like and uh like i guess it's kind of that's when i go if i'm trying to really dive into a topic um I don't want to take it as far. Like an example would be like my thesis, right? But um, even if I'm trying to do something like for the podcast, why we do what we do that we record, um, I still got to chunk out like two or three hours of time because we're tackling a topic that I have almost no clue about and I have to be able to sort that out as fast as I can through through scouring the research. But I guess I find it myself a lot of times trying to um, find things that maybe uh, support or contradict the way I've deduced it from a behavioral perspective myself. So how you were saying, like how you sit down, you're like, this is probably how it goes. Um, and you kind of sort it out yourself. I try to then go and fact check myself in a sense of like, is this how other people broke it down? Um, Cause it's never the same. 99% of the time they're, 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 they've added some things cause they some, spent so much more time on it. That's really useful. Um, but I've, yeah. And I think that's a good way to start figuring out what your blind spots are, you know, like where, you can kind of step back and look at, okay, once you've done that and engaged in that practice, where were my gaps and uh, where did they hit and like, why are those occurring? So it's a fun, like self-development 
perspective as for well. For sure. Absolutely. And that's that's actually a thing because I had a friend of mine say, well, like, listen, you do all this mentorship, you do all this BCBA supervision, like, where do you get your professional development? It's like, well, aside from being in school, like, I, that's how I do it, I think. I think you do you can do self-development if you're willing to put the time in and to engage with the material and be totally self-critical of yourself. Because I think that's the thing, like, when we start getting into, like, the best way to consume literature and critically a- analyze it and, like, where do you go for it, I think it's more like what, what I want to describe to people here and what I hope they have is that, like, it should be this self-discovery process that's a lot more than just reading a paper and, like, taking instructions, you know? It's a lot more – it should be – it should be – a, a a process of engaging with something, wrestling with it, and internalizing it in such a way that it becomes useful to you, and it also becomes knowledge and wisdom, not just information to be executed on. And I think those are different things. And that's kind of it. Um, I find myself going to the literature base less, but it's not that I'm engaging to. I'm engaging in that that overall functional process of learning more or less. It's like I've slowly started to shift where I'm pulling my information from. Um, I have an example here of, uh, you saw me digging for it probably, but it's the APA Handbook of Behavior Analysis. There's, yeah, two volumes. It's fantastic. They have a whole chapter by William Dube, uh, Doobie um, on tra- translational research and behavior analysis, right? Like there's there's things like this. This is a $400 series. It's ridiculously expensive. Um, I was gifted it as a result of like helping start a center because <laughs> um, I was too broke to buy these sort of things. But these are things like, yeah, I, I saw it come out two years later. I get my hands on it. I slowly read through it throughout a year. And I don't remember all this sort of stuff. It's not all committed to, to, to general knowledge like you're talking about. Um, but I know where to go. And that's like something that I learned real quick was got to know where to go when it comes to uh, certain functions of my day. Like if I'm going to talk about something, I need to make sure that I know where it is so I can go back, fact check myself and make sure I, I, I articulate it correctly. Um yeah, yeah, in a sense. Um, that's why I keep all these things around still, these books. Dude, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I Like, my books, my library is the the thing – my books are the things I've had the longest. And I mean, like <laughs> – I mean, I have books that I have since like my freshman year of college. It's crazy. Like I was almost homeless at one point, <laughs> like, and living on couch surfing, you know, right after college, and had. But my books were in a were in a trash bag that went with me everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> it's like I cannot. My wife has been after me to get rid of some of this shit. I will not. Like I don't know what it is. I have this attachment to it. Like I just cannot get rid of these books. I mean, that's before we hit air. I was talking about how like the more. Um, the more you like spend time with things, the more the probability is that that thing starts to identify you and be a part of you, right? And and that's how it is with me too, man. Like, I will not let these two giant bookshelves go. Um, I've <laughs> I had a breakup one time that was like pretty rough, and I was like, oh, everything is fair game except for the books and the guitars. <laughs> Just. <laughs> Like, just, that's what I've put my life, like, that's, that's the two things there that were like, I really want to retain these. So, um, anyhow, to get back on course here, we go to the literature base for, for different reasons. Um, uh, you know, my, my first go-to, if I can, is an edited book chapter. The reason being is somebody has already done a pretty extensive literature review, uh, presumably to be able to write this sort of thing. Um. And it's going to have like the most breadth of the information, I guess, that's out there. So, for example, this one that I was talking, referencing the APA handbook, um, they are a series of, I think there's about 30 chapters each in both that are all an edited book, edited chapters. Um, and what you get in a sense of that is a, a whole lot of information, but you have a little bit of an internal peer review process. The editors are also looking over the work that the author did on the chapter. And so for me, it's kind of got like a dual layer um, like we have in, we have this in our research journals, right? With the editors. Um, but I, th- but I think it's just, it's, it's, there's just more efficient information when it comes to edited books. So that's always my first go-to. Um, second is if I can't find anything on it, I try to actually ask someone first, which I used to, used to get a hand slap for, cause it's like, Hey, just go find it yourself. You need to build that repertoire. But it's like, can you shorten the path for me? Um, so that I can re- spend my time reading it all rather than spending all my time searching for it. Um, yeah, so 
if there's a topic like critical thinking, my first thought there was Joe Lang. Like I would, I would hit Joe Lang up and he would tell me, here's your syllabus essentially, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> and you'd be like, okay, I have three, three years of reading now, uh, lined up on this. But, um, that's my second, my third go-to is usually just independent searches on Google scholar, scholar and various, uh, places, WebSco, things like that. Um, Psych info, whatnot. Exactly. All the above. I mean, my first move is not actually the journals. My first move is the books. And because the books are just neat, they're tight, or lit reviews in general rather than like just a direct <clears throat> experiment or research article. Because like the lit review helps give you context too, and it might help narrow down your search, you know? Because like, dude, doing research for execution or practice is, is, almost more arduous than the experimentation itself honestly because experiment and, doing an experiment is tedious but like t- sitting down and doing a lit review and trying to figure out where the fuck you even start is <laughs> is so time consuming and frustrating and, and like yeah that's why the the edited books are my go-to i would I, you, reminded, you reminded me of one caveat that i want to add there which is uh um and this goes with anything but your your data publication this one was first printed in uh 2012 I think the big thing to remember there is like, this is absent of anything after 2012. Um, but this gives me essentially a, a, a historical perspective up until 2012 of what's happened. Yeah, of that course. is why I love them. For sure, dude. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care about, for the first, for the starting point, I don't care about date. Because like, for me, it's like, the way I, I think about it is like, I'm looking for the loose thread to tug on. And once I tug on that loose thread, then the entire sweater will unravel for me. You see what I'm saying? But I got to find that loose thread. Otherwise, I'm just like searching for needle in a haystack. And it it never happens the way you want it to happen. Yeah. Uh, And actually, that's where sometimes you get your best ideas. Like sometimes you're trying to do something. and It's like, holy shit. Actually, no one's done this. And I think this is going to fucking crush. Ding. I'm doing this. You know, and this is how you can like maybe find some cool ideas, too. I mean, that's how my thesis popped up. It was just like, hey, uh, everything we do as behavior analyst to be able to help somebody out has to, to some degree, do with taking the perspective of the other person living in their shoes to whatever degree you can. You can't do it perfectly. Um, and like, what does that, it brought up questions of like, does that impact the quality of your practitioner skills? Does that, in, um, is there a way that we could actually teach this more efficiently? So for example, uh, almost every disagreement I feel like on social media is a lack of understanding the other person's perspective more so than actual disagreement. <laughs> and that might just be where they're coming at from their assumptions or whether or not, you know what I mean? Um, and so like, I was like, man, this is like, there's a lot of implications off of this. And it was really just a springboard. So let's go. Go. The best that. segue is like, okay, so we got the literature base. We have an idea of what we're tugging on. But the real question now is what the hell do we do with it? Like, it, let's just say I got the book, I got the article, I got the thing that I want to absorb, but like, am I, do I have the capacity to really do this? Cause I mean like, and this is just being totally fair. Cause I'll read shit like uh, taking this translational class of reading, reading experimental analysis stuff, which is like for me, like reading a stereo instruction manual while someone plays <laughs> classical music and dose me with Ambien. Okay. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> it's a horrible night. I imagine that. And like how hard that would be. <laughs> Dude. It's like, I imagine you drooling on like your work and trying to get through it. <laughs> Dude, for real though. Like it's so, Oh my God, man, that shit is so like, I'm telling this, you, that hissing cockroach about, article seriously scarred me. Get, get, it's like well, only like eight pages. It took me like five hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's here's what I was taught by uh, good old Mark. We we talk about him now and then. He listens Mark to Malady, the shout out to the guy, the legend. He taught me like those things that are super hard to get through. There's got to be some value in them. Um, and there's going to be a few layers here. So there's got to be some value in them. Um that's, you know, assigned by whatever, like some arbitrary value in, in these. But there's also a degree of like complexity and skill set that you have to learn to be able to understand that complexity. And so what he taught me was, uh, hey, if you're trying to learn something and make it uh, learn how to be more effective as a practitioner and bring something useful into your life um, tomorrow, you should be reading something like that and reading something like that uh, article that you discussed. Something for me at the time when he really taught me this was like Pepper's World Hypotheses, um, these philosophical books, right, that were just really dense and hard for me to pull through. And he's like, read a chapter of, you know, that world, for me, that world hypotheses. 
read a chapter of the uh, verbal behavior um, applic uh, applied book that you're reading right now, you know? And it's like tomorrow I could go in, I could use something that I read in a sense kind of like from a, a molar level, like reinforcing that reading. But on the uh, backside of that was after a month, I had finished, you know, a number of things that I would have never have gotten through if I had not kind of altered back and forth between them. And so a lot of people are like, how do you know these esoteric, like dry articles or whatnot? And I'm like, oftentimes are those the things that I love the most in behavior analysis, but they were the hardest to get through because of the skill development, the time, the not immediate applicability in your life. But they're like the most beautiful ones, man. And the most, and the, just the brain twisting and reading it to make sure that you're understanding the words coming out of your mouth, out of the, out yeah. of like, cause some, I mean, they're written, like, for example, this is a book, mm -hmm. Learning and Complex Behavior, the Donahoe Palmer book, this one. Yeah. This book, holy it's shit. It's fantastic. Man. It's an amazing book. It yeah. took me a year to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a year, if not more, actually, maybe, a, maybe a year and a half. Like, but it is as far as like really providing you an unbelievable, like primer and just like in-depth understanding of like complexity of behavior and stuff. It was a f evolutionary like science in the context of behavior before even like that uh, Hayes book even came out and stuff like just a, like a perspective that I had never really thought of, but holy shit, dude, it literally took me almost actually now look about over a year. Like, cause it was like, okay, yeah. I can get through like 15 pages and that's like, my eyes are bleeding. That's it for the bit. week. I'm yeah, like, I'm done. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> Let's go back on the shelf. We'll be back. Uh, and that's acceptable, yeah. you know. Uh, but that's also it's how weird. you do your own professional development too. So, I mean, part of talking about research here is also like and conception of it for the listener and why this is like. I don't know if this is entertaining or good. I don't know at this point. I'm just talking. But um, part of why we're talking about the process is be and like when people ask us like back to what you were saying like how do you know all this shit like like well, holy shit is all you do is like no like you 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 take bites out of stuff. And you come back to it. You know, you have a buffet of learning, dude. That's what it is. It's the, <laughs> it's the ponderosa of learning. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not tasty, but it's acceptable. And it's it's cheap in terms of, like, time and effort. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything if you're willing to put the time in. So You know, one way that I also realized that I sorted through it quite a bit uh, to share to everyone was when I was entering a topic that I hadn't yet known um, – I always tried to have someone fact check me in a sense or discuss it with me afterwards. So we've done this a few different ways. Sit down with a mentor, sit down with a book club, um, which is kind of like, hey, all of us are going to tackle this. And hopefully out of the 20 of us or whatever that's there, we can sort this out correctly <laughs> um, or a combination of that sometimes. Like we used to um, have this group of people that would just like tackle a topic. So we'd be like gold diamond. We want to read everything about Israel gold diamond. So we'd ask, we'd get like, say, 12, 15 readings. We'd spend the uh, two months reading through them all independently, sometimes check in a little bit, but then we'd sit together with a, on a, like a three hour meeting with someone like Joe Lang and he would help us parse out like what we may have misunderstood, the possible implications, this sort of stuff and things like that. Um, and for me, when I'm getting a new area, that sort of subject matter expertise, right? Of this person that knows a lot about that. If you can figure out how to get time with them, which is really usually just a function of show them you put the work in and that you really want to understand and use it. Um, that really has helped me. Um, and that has been present with everything, man, um, that I've like really dove into is there was always that, that entity that functioned as uh, kind of a fact check mentor. Yeah. Sense. Let's, we get, I want to come back to that, but um, yeah, man, actually I'm the, a little bit of the opposite. I actually prefer solitary reading. I, I don't like book book clubs for me are hard because I end up cheating like, cause I just don't have the discipline to put like if I, I end up thinking it should be a shared endeavor and I like do my reading and stuff, but then I don't put the time into necessarily like really like want to absorb it. And like, again, do like the whole little like rain man, beautiful mind routine with it that I like I <laughs> to in order to like make it permanent. Yeah. Uh, and then I, 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 end, I end up not having as much, I don't get as much value out of it after, after I do my thing, then it's good to talk about it. I like the polemics personally. So like for me, the Socratic method is what makes me feel like it's valuable and also what makes it sticky. <clears throat> so I like going through the process by myself, really taking it in and really like just feeling confused on my own and, and the suffering that goes with it. And then after I've gone through that process and I've thought about it a little bit, then I like picking, then I go to the SME or whatever, or like someone who's smarter than I am, or at least someone who's equally as read on the topic at this point or, and I can like wrestle with them and have them argue with me so I can get my like understanding at a clear logical place. Um, so that's kind of like how I like to go through it. But I mean like, so let's get into like critical evaluation. So like, 
let's just say like how so like what does that really look like right what does that absorption really look like what is that you know internalizing information and making it useful for you what does it really look like what does consumption look like well first and foremost it's critical evaluation I mean, I think we talk about philosophic doubt a lot in terms of like a value and a pillar of the field, but I don't yeah. think that it's well defined. So, Nor do we do we, and engaging in it's tricky because you can easily say that you're engaging in it and get a bunch of weird social reinforcement when when the question is, are you really engaging in it correctly? So, so philosophic okay, doubt so, is rooted in the in the notion of of asking why, what where when how is it valuable yes. okay it's the w's um and like really asking them in a way where like you're almost trying to undermine the thing you know like that's what real philosophic doubt is argument deconstruction from a philosophical position is the idea of taking an argument, which is what every article you ever read is, every article, every discussion section, every introduction section, every everything that you read is an argument. It's a it's a it's a collection of premises, with yep. logical with logical uh, logical things uh, conclusions that are drawn from them that form a particular line of thought <clears throat> that articulate a particular narrative. What you know, like so, like. When we're using the word argument here, back to like vernacular, you don't use it in terms of like fighting with each other. Use it in terms of a construction of thoughts, of, of premises that lead to particular conclusions based on the, the principles of logic and reason. <clears throat> um, so like, yeah, you take this thing and, and you should be fighting it. Like, that's how I internalize this stuff. I tr As I'm reading something, I'm literally saying, nope, maybe, okay, nope, fuck you, I don't think so. Uh, where the hell did you get this? Like, yeah. like literally arguing with the page. Um, and the reason that's important is because if you're doing that and you get at the end and you're like, oh, I was actually wrong, then <clears throat> not only... Well, you remember it, and I promise you will remember it, because <laughs> it offended your sensibilities at one point. <laughs> but number two, you engaged in critical practice. You know, you really ran it through the caveat and the gambit of like what it is to be a meaningful, useful thing that matters to you. So let's so what is so let's going back to critical evaluation. What are some of the questions that you ask yourself? Number one, what's the agenda? What are they trying yep. to prove? Like, yep. what's the question, man? First of all, this, what is the question? This, this can be looked at from multiple layers. The the author themselves, also the journal. Um, I don't know how many folks know this, and I don't think many behavior analysts get caught in this right now, but there are journals in which you can just pay to get your research published. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, I don't think that's going on in our field. Our field's pretty small and pretty on top of like that shouldn't be a thing that's going on um they call them predatory journals usually and when there's one that's found to be trying to go for some behavior analysts it's usually shared internally and saying watch out for these guys um just kind of save everybody the time but the yeah this is a great place to start man um uh for example in the bottom of the disclaimer of like the translational chapter that i just had open there's this little footnote, which most people don't pay attention to these sort of things, but it says preparation for this chapter was supported in part by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, um, primarily on grants, and they list the grant numbers. Uh, I don't know to what degree they told uh, good old William here to write certain words, but there's a, an increased probability by reading that that somebody may have influenced the words in this chapter, right? Um and that's something, I guess, that's an, a, a one that I literally experienced today while we are recording this, right, of, of I think what you're getting at here is we just have to think about where these sort of things coming from. Exactly. Uh, that's all. And, and, and to be fair, I don't think that it discredits it either. Like, and, and no. We talk What's, about disclosure, right? And this guy rocked it. It sounds like what he did is he actually lined up contingencies to where he got um, some support to put his research into something that was so... Uh, important have like a stamp in time of behavior analysis. So like my 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 thought goes there on both sides. My I would say my heart's usually believing on, you know, my heart side of it's like this guy's probably doing the right thing, but the scientific side is like got to question this for a second. Cuz I mean, I got to be honest, the other thing is like what's the research question? Too is what I was also getting at. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, like a lot of research that you read, sometimes the it, you can you can not even bother reading the article if the question in and of itself they're asking 
is complete fucking nonsense. You know what I mean? <laughs> if the question doesn't hold, and I actually will give an example of this um, that is, you know, not a criticism of anyone personally or anything like that. But uh, and we we kind of recorded we not kind of we did record a podcast that they didn't release on the topic. But uh, for example. <clears throat> There's a recent uh, article that was published in 2019 in Java, a translational evaluation of potential iatrogenic effects of single and combined contingencies during functional analysis by Retzlaff, Fisher, Ackers, and Greer. Now, you read this and you're like, well, first of all, what the hell are iatrogenic effects and what do they have to do with behavior analysis? But <laughs> uh, uh, the way that, uh, that's totally legit and it's a cool thing. <clears throat> but the question they ask is in my opinion as someone who like really tackles fa stuff because that's kind of like my area of interest and kind of like where i want to specialize in like when i read this question in and of itself i read it out of curiosity because i like the drama of it but if i were reading it for research purposes i would have chucked the article why because the way they even structure the research question in and of itself to me is an is 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 what's called it's stacking the deck it's armoring their uh it's called it's it's armoring their uh, conclusion out of the gate it's 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 assuming the consequent so they're already engaging in a certain degree of circulating circularity that's going to produce the result that they want before they even get to the point where they engage in the exercise itself not to kind mention of sounds like studying an artifact of the system or exactly something like not to mention yeah. they also structure it in terms of engaging in a category mistake and i'll be specific what they what they what they do here is a comparison between a standard functional analysis and a Synthesized contingency analysis. Now, some would say, well, that's Greg Hanley's ISCA versus regular standard FA. But that's not what they're doing. They actually created their own version of a standardized contingency analysis that's not been in any, not been represented in any other research, but it's their own version of it. So they've created what's called a straw man, which is a logical fallacy. Okay. So in and of itself, the research question is predicated on the notion of a straw man, which it, which means it's it's a logical fallacy, which means any conclusions that they draw from it in and of itself are invalidated just from that, as far as I'm concerned, from a deductive framework. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say that what they did isn't interesting and it's not worth reading for like conversation's sake, but in terms yeah. of informing what you want to do and how you want to go about it, in my opinion, it's like not a thing that's worth like the really in-depth time you have to put into it. And that also brings up what you were talking about on the, you know, questioning why this is out there in the first place. Uh, if anybody's paying attention to that research line, it's pretty clear uh, that there's a tiff between the two lines of thinking going on, and it's kind of like a who who can publish the most on this right now, uh, the quickest to try to like win over this presumed group of people that I don't know that are actually really paying that much attention to it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like I'm like one of six guys that gives a shit. So like, <laughs> so like. So let's go back to this. So first of all, what is the research question or what, what are the assumptions that we're operating on? And enumerate them. What are their assumptions? Number two is, you know what? This is going to sound kind of cynical, but it's important for philosophic doubt. Assume they're lying. Like it's, it seems counterintuitive in our field, which is a very caring, you know, positive, uh, perpetuating, like very like promotional place where people just want to really uplift each other to tell someone, Hey, listen, I understand that, all th that, you know, we want to support each other and support the field and blah, blah, blah. But supporting the field in terms of like understanding research and understanding like outcomes and evidence actually means that you have to assume people are not are telling are bullshitting you. You have to assume that they're lying and, and then uh, make them prove themselves from there. Like the burden of proof is on them. To take another angle on the same line of thought is, uh, and to bring in assumptions. So we, we all operate with these foundational assumptions, whether we've articulated them or not, on what sort of evidence uh, will be acceptable for us to, to start to call things facts or sure. principles of behavior or whatnot. And uh, I got really interested in this Hayes, Hayes and Reese 1988 article, uh, where they were really outlining different ways you can go about uh trying to sort out what your assumptions are, but what other assumptions may be out there. And when I started this personal practice of like, for example, sitting in a conference and listening to somebody speak about something, it was fun to start trying to categorize like where are their assumptions and like, how are they starting to, to, to benchmark this evidence um, and from what perspective? And I found oftentimes that people would flip flop in our own field exactly. between like a contextual framework, a mechanistic framework, they kind of go back and forth between these two. And if you call almost anybody that publishes behavior analysis mechanistic or you say that they have me mechanistic assumptions, they will usually lose their shit. But when you look at the actual way in which they're formulating their arguments, they are there. Those notions are there. Exactly. Um, and it's not 
for me, when I talk about, uh, I had one prominent dude that I like asked in person and he, he like lost his shit because I like <laughs> asked him if he was mechanistic and it's not a, it's not supposed to be some sort of, um, attack on character. It's just like, this is my understanding of like where all your writing comes from. Um, and it's not the same framework where I see other people's writing or like my own views lie. And, and for me, that's not looking at, are they lying, but it's more so like, do, do they understand where they're coming from? Do I understand where they understand they're coming from or they think they're coming from? Right. And those sort of questions help me out. Cause that's also when it comes to what research is valuable. Like if somebody is chasing, for example, this inner mental hypothetical agent, most of us as behavior analysts just write that off as like, that's not something that's useful. <laughs> right. Um, but we have those same sort of crap practices start to kind of creep in sometimes. Um, yeah, and I don't know, that's, that's, there's like a whole area of, of, of hey man, uh, assumptions and presuppositions and, and like, again, actually to use, and I don't like using the word bias because people then go other places with it, but it, there is a particular disciplinary bias, you know, or even personal bias in terms of like thinking towards the thing that you want to prove, right? Because it's exciting. You know, if you're a researcher, or like you want to, pr- you have a thought that you want to prove to the world. Basically, that's what this is. This is like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm Einstein, baby. I'm Benjamin Franklin with a key on a kite. You know, I'm going to prove something, you know, the excitement, the enthusiasm, all those things, you kind of get blind spots just automatically because you, you're, you're on a quest, man. You're trying to slay a dragon. So, um, I, it's, it's sometimes not intentional. So I know that saying that like, assume they're lying sounds like uh, pejorative and that's not necessarily the point. The point is that like, assume that, nece- that there's possibilities that there's blind spots that people didn't even necessarily consider because of their zeal for the point that they're trying to prove. You know, yeah, um, which is an unintentional and like, lie, and and you got to think about like a lot of the prominent researchers now. Um, I mean, you can take three people, four people, that are in like the verbal behavior world: Steve Hayes, Mark Dixon, Mark Sundberg, and uh, Pat McGreevy. We, I guarantee you, everyone listening out there loves someone of those. But all of them are in kind of a different assumptions world of how they're operating. And that's why there's these polarization effects across the four of them. Why some people love the work of others, maybe not so much the others. And it just comes down to their assumptions and what they're trying to chase after. And disagreements between those two. (laughs) That's it. They're not necessarily all wrong or all right. No, that's like the beautiful part of assumptions, man. I'm working on this video. I got to figure out how to articulate perfectly, but like, The most beautiful thing is the assumptions in our field because you can't necessarily critique one or the other. You can, in a sense, there's kind of the side argument of which one's more practical and useful, which kind of brings it back into our contextual pragmatic framework. Um, But you can't like hate the person for having a different set of assumptions because you can't evaluate another person's assumptions as valid or not based on your own assumptions. And also that's the fun (laughs) part, man. Yeah. The whole fun part. Dude, listen, part of being a nerd, a dork, a geek, a dweeb, (laughs) pick your your label part of being like that guy is the fight about it is sitting around with a cup of coffee and like i don't no longer smoke cigarettes back in the day having a cigarette was awesome and like literally <laughs> like getting to the point where you're yelling at each other but you're yelling at each other because it's so much fun like you know i saw this uh, we use this meme of a couple of two of my best friends from high school we were like uh we're all living across the country now one's in new york one's in california and they're like hey we should get a an online risk game going or Monopoly. And it's like, you don't understand. We used to play corporate Monopoly. Like, we would literally, like, we would hurt each other's feelings. <laughs> like, board flips, you know, and, like, anger and ruin friendships. But, I mean, like, that's not, you're not actually ruining your friendship. It's, like, the passion, the fun. Like, that's that's where, like, that's where the best <coughs> stuff comes from. You know, polemics. That's what polemics are. That's what discourse is. Discourse is getting your blood boiling, but then simmering down and remember that you're all in this because you both love the same thing. Um, which actually brings us to the next thing. <clears throat> Look at methods. I think that, you know, I, I was in a conversation a while back and someone was like, listen, especially when I was getting fresh in my doc program, they were like, you know, hey, you, I was like, I read everything. Like, I read it all. It takes hours and hours, but I, I'm like scared not to read it because I don't want to get exposed. I don't want to get caught, you know, not knowing what the hell I'm talking about. And they were like, that'll that'll pass. <laughs> you'll you'll start reading the introduction. You'll peruse the, the, the methods and then you'll skip the results, get to the discussion limitations, and you'll just want to like fast forward stuff. And like sometimes I do that, but for the most part, I still read everything. And I've actually found that the place where I find the most weaknesses in an article is actually the method section because the methods is where they structure the experiment and how you structure the experiment sets up how you're going to produce, how you're going to get particular results that you're going to get. 
So like that's the actual argument for whether or not the results have have any weaknesses or validity to them, in my opinion. So actually, I like to look at the methods a lot more closely than probably most people would recommend to. Um, and mostly because like, again, it, if you have a weak argument, you have weak results. If you have weak results, they are less valid than they could be. And if they're yeah. less valid than they could be, they carry less weight and deserve to be spoken to in such spoken of in such a way in which they have less weight. That's just there the is, fair, uh, fair turnabout this, and fair play. There's this term we used to use in my social group in grad school all the time um, about the uh, Pepsi challenge. And so what this came from was an advertising marketing brilliance, I would say, where where Pepsi set up a blind taste test on the streets in New York or something like that. Uh, I think this is in like the 80s. I can't remember exactly. Um, and uh, it was really simple. You're going to choose one or the other um, uh, that you preferred more over the other one that was out there. And the other was presumably Coke. So they put Coke and Pepsi blind. They don't know which it is. Uh, and people... <laughs> I would say not unanimously, but damn near, <laughs> like we're selecting Pepsi over Coke. And uh, this was like such a such an issue that like Coke went to such extremes of like launching new Coke. Like there was entire like like tens and hundreds of millions of dollars put into trying to recover um, from this. Yes. And and what it was when you looked at there is there's different sugar concentration levels between Coke and Pepsi. There's more in Pepsi, at least at the time. And so in lower quantities, lower fluid ounces, people would select, because of our predispositions towards sugar, <laughs> the, the Pepsi over the Coke more frequently. They learned this, they used this, they leveraged this, they set up the experiment, social experiment on the streets, I'm using air quotes there, and... Uh, Lo and behold, that's what happened. And it was just the Pepsi challenge. They just stacked the deck in their favor. So when you're talking about uh, research articles, oftentimes when I'm thinking of like, are they lying? Are they stacking the deck? Um, is, there, is there certain assumptions that they have that others don't generally carry in the field? And that's why this might be harder to publish or it might be, you know, like there's all sorts of different things out there to kind of ask yourself. Um, that was one of the most brilliant ones. We used to ask ourselves, like, was there a Pepsi challenge in this article? Like, was the deck... That's literally the critique I have of this article. I think it's a Pepsi challenge. <laughs> Actually, that's great that you put that. Yeah, this uh, Rhett's laugh. This... It's useful in the context and bubble in which it was asked. But yeah. the question is, is that context and bubble useful for the larger world? <laughs> um, so that's that's it. Which, to sorry, to close the, the Pepsi challenge out, if they had would, would have had larger quantities and had people drinking 40, 50, or whatever fluid ounces of of it then presumably they would have selected coke because you're not getting sick off of it as quickly as if you were getting uh drinking all the pepsi so it's like one of those things where it's just the the way in which it was designed or it would have been much more of a coin flip for. just because in lieu of just general preference making across the board like it would have been a lot yeah. more variable um all right and then so we look at the methods and the second thing is like look at the graphs this one is one of those things that like again even for myself as a, as a consumer of literature as a as a person who reads this stuff you as a listener would absolutely pee your pants at how much the graphs don't match the results or how much the graphs <laughs> don't match the discussions like it is absolutely astounding how frequently people manipulate their graphs the visual representation of them the actual like the discussion in terms of like degrees of differentiation or how much control was exhibited upon withdrawals like you would absolutely your brain would blow up if you would go back to some of the seminal articles that you probably keep in the back of your mind as a as a practitioner that you justify what you do on and you actually checked out to see do does do the graphs match this shit um and like <clears throat> the biggest critique actually and this is where like for like i want to give rick kubina his due um because this is really rick's thing and i totally like i don't love the chart uh but i don't hate it but i do agree with this point in that like the lack of standardization of graphs in our field mm -hmm. does yield the ability to manipulate scales okay i mean and he usually talks about the analogy of like the ekg and he's like what if every doctor <laughs> was assessing how your heart is beating or these other things right on a totally different scale no one would be able to like talk and communicate and, like there'd be people dying all over the place and it's just like oh it's acceptable in the psychology and behavior analysis world but not over here but it's like <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> you know, so there's like, a, it's a thing, man. There's a book that he put me on to years ago called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information um, by, I believe, Edward Tufty. Tufty's the last name. I think it's Edward. Oh, I don't um, know that one. Let me see that. Put that on the screen so I can see it. Edward R. Tufty. It's just... Uh, yeah, there's there's just like a greenish gray book, but the cool thing is he just literally looks at and asks the questions of like how do we visually display quantitative information? So he talks about graphical excellence, graphical integrity, sources of graphical integrity and sophistication, um, as like this graphical practice. But it's a, an entire like I don't know ninety ish pages on on asking questions like this, and there's some insane graphical representations that you would never think of that makes sense as a result of how you're trying to display what type of information. Um, the second part is like theory of data graphics and like really getting into it. But essentially there was someone again in history that was so nerdy that they spent time to really break down and create a good outline as to how we should approach these sort of things. Um, and the standardization under certain contexts is what he argues. And that's why I think, uh, uh, Rick loved him so much. Um, it's 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 preposterous <laughs> that we don't have this sorted out as a field. That's why these words fucking. Th- there's no other word to describe some. Of this we stuff. we were it's founded right? like we would not be here if it wasn't for the cumulative record um, and that thing being standardized. It was standardized. Most people probably don't know this fun fact uh, based on species. So there was different graphical um, ways in which you did things based on the species on like what your your y axis. Um, was ticked at and like the 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 units were um and we just we threw that all out the window when we started working in applied behavior analysis <laughs> like and and started bringing it outside of it um not that there's not useful things that have come from that per se but as a as a practice that touts science the scientific method and like wanting so hard to be a hard science i feel you on that but I also find it hard to justify in uh, different social circles when we don't engage in certain practices like that. So uh, let's, so just for like the listener, like tips to take away, what, what some useful tools for graph look, looking at a graph aside from the basic level. Um, Dude, number, <laughs> number one is like, just look at the X and Y axes. Are they, there's some basic things like, is there a real unit of time involved? Cause that's supposed to be there to some extent. Like, is it, and, and it doesn't have to be, but the more you're getting to like these real units of time, so you're say avoiding sessions and counting days or weeks, like that gives you a sense of uh, more air quote true time as like how long did the study occur over? Not that you can't pull those apart or reanalyze the data and look at them in those sort of ways, but it just kind of takes less burden off the reader, I'd say, if you do those sort of things. Um, and you should be looking for that. And then the other one I always was taught to look at was just on your, your Y axis, were they the same across subjects? For example, if you're comparing across graphs, um, oftentimes people like to say, you know, the the change um, was equal between a one and a, the the change the amount of change equal between say um, one and two responses per minute is the same as between fifty and fifty one because they're both the change of one, but really proportionally those are extremely off. And so if you were to put those on the same axes. Um, they would look totally different than if you put them on the same axis. On the same axis, my video, on the same axis, um, those are going to look like very, very small uh, changes for the 50 to 51 and large for the one to two. But if you were to put them on their own individual axes, you can actually stretch them to the point, right, that they look proportional. And so it's just being aware of how those graph construction can start to to change your proportions and stretch out things like level, trend, variability. It's just it's just spending the time to think of, oh, someone may have constructed in a way that it altered those. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think and, and the, the, two, the two things to add to that that are not necessarily are the, the actual experimental control piece, like during a withdrawal, did was there a change? Like just look for that. Was there a change? You know, or even like if it's a one, if it's like a AB design and you, you don't do a withdrawal, right? Is there a change, like an actual substantive change that resulted as a, you know, following the particular intervention? And then the yeah. other thing is like, is there differentiation? So like, is there a distinction between the different data sets that are being compared or, or checked out? Like looking for separation. You're looking for separation of stuff. Like that stuff needs to be a thing that you're looking at because like that tells you if there's actually something going on there, if there's just like some bizarro interpreter results. And my example is always coming back. And again, FA is kind of where I live. So like 
But I mean, like, I can't tell you how many standard functional analyses I've looked at from a graphical perspective where they claim there is a, a clean function and it's like looking at a Pollock painting. <laughs> <laughs> but there just happens to be one line that sticks out a little bit further than the rest. You know how many students have ran into test questions like that where they're like, I do not know how to discriminate between successful and not successful and <laughs> differentiated, and not differentiated because of that. Yeah. So like it and and honest to God, like if we're if we're wearing our critical hat and our philosophical doubt on our sleeve here, if that's not there, don't let them Jedi mind trick you into thinking that they're just smarter than you are because they're not. <laughs> it be like think it's bullshit and be okay with that like that's an acceptable position and make yeah. it because the burden because part of this too is that like understanding how to consume literature is also understanding how argumentation works just in terms of like the dialectic piece of it so like the social component of it and the social mm -hmm. component is about who does the burden of proof fall on the burden of proof in any discourse or dialectic falls on the person making a claim does not mm -hmm. fall on you on accepting it. So like when you're reading an article, you have to see that as someone making a declaration of a claim. I claim this, great. Then the burden of proof is on you for me to accept your claim. And if the, if the data points and the graphs don't match the claim, then the, you, you, are val you are justified in rejecting it. Um, so that's just a thing there to think about in terms of like burden of proof too, because going back to like you were talking about like the four people, you know, um, or even like an FA is Fisher, Iwata, Hanley, whatever, you know, like the, the, the default to arguments of authority and the default to these prominent figures makes it a little easier for them to publish just in general, in terms of the way the culture is structured in terms of the way those things go. And like, that doesn't make it good, bad or ugly. It just is reputation is everything guarded with your life. That's a rule of power. Which, right? By the way, there is an article for that on the, on in Java, uh, about how, certain uh, lineages lead, lend you a little bit more of a favor to getting published um, in our own journals. The, yeah, I mean, we do that all the way back to Skinner, man, like, and other prominent figures, right? Sure. I, I, but I mean, like, what I'm saying, though, is that, like, as a consumer, as someone who's reading stuff... <laughs> You know what I mean? If you're tr if you're doing your best, because man, a lot of people like I have to say, like I'm pretty. I think that I think a proud point of our field is, despite the fact that you know we talk about the quality control issues in it, people do try. You know what I mean? There's 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 Facebook oh, yeah. pages yeah. and groups of ten thousand plus behavior people who are like, hey, can someone give me some resources on this? I want to get better. Like yeah. I think that's a commendable thing. You know, the, so then the question is like. Does that getting better substantive and is that like attempt actually being uh, maximized to get what you, you want know, to get out of it? And like and this, having the this, confidence, having the confidence to like be able to say, you know what? I don't <clears throat> care how prominent this figure is or like how much respect they have or how many like whatever their, their bona fide is. Right. Like this one thing they did. They're actually kind of wrong on this. And and I can say that not because I'm another expert, but simply because when I look at this data set, when I read this argument, when I see the premises, when I see the assumptions, when I see the construction of what happened and the results as they relate to the discussion and limitations as they're described, they did not achieve the goal that they actually set out to, or they achieved a different result that they're not being necessarily completely honest about. Um, or they just have so many blind spots, they don't even know they're not being honest, which is also possible. Yeah. The uh, other thing you kind of got me thinking of was... I don't know the degree to which this goes on. And I think it's a lack, I want to be clear. I think it's a lack of proper training around these sort of things um, systemically in our field. But there's there's a difference between being philosophically uh, kind of in doubt of something or questioning something and being able to articulate why and link it together and just like writing it off. And I get, af I get afraid that with how fast the field's growing that we're kind of taught like, oh, philosophical doubt is kind of like questioning things forever and like blah, blah, blah. And I see this sometimes in forms of like, oh, I disagree with that. <laughs> like, why? Like, how? Like, how does this link up to, you know, contextualism, like the philosophical underpinnings of our field? Um, like, there's got to be more substance in that. And I don't know. It's like a call for like, if you're going to, discredit or discount something to some degree like can you then take the next step in articulating why oh that's and 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 this is a, a it's a great point thank you so like this is a sword that cuts both ways this is an edge that has two sides to it absolutely you can't just say this is garbage because i don't agree with it that's an unacceptable thing to say in my opinion not in my opinion actually factually you should not ever do that philosophic doubt 
is more than just the a, a denial. It's not a clear. De- it is being able to is denying through evidence and facts. Right. It's a denial based on the evidence. That's what pragmatism is, man. Going back to when we're talking about pragmatism and again, back to this vernacular, there's a vernacular definition of pragmatism, you know, which is practical. That's vernacular. But the philosophical definition of pragmatism is the best argument based on the best evidence available to you. Okay, that's what prag- that's what real pragmatism is. So the question is, is this the best argument based on the best evidence? And in order for you to claim to be pragmatic, you have to be making the be- if and if your argument is a denial, which is an acceptable position, I am a denier quite frequently. <laughs> You need to have the best argument based on the best evidence. Um, and if you're ev- if you can't articulate your evidence, then you don't have, then you're not, you, honestly, you're not allowed to be the denier then. Like then you're just, a, or you should just be honest, intellectually honest, and declare that it's an opinion. That's it. And that was the quote I was thinking of is something to the fact of, of, uh, of you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. And it's, and it's just. It's just a practice of us all as behavior analysts knowing which hat we're putting on, trying to make that clear if we're writing it out there, um, when it goes from opinion to a, a fact. And if you're going to engage in this sort of stuff, and I, I think you got to be really careful in linking it together um, as to why empirically, why <laughs> conceptually, uh, why philosophically you may disagree with something. Um, and that's the hard part. I think that's what we're always chasing. Like, I feel like I've gotten better at that. I will never be perfect at it. And it's something that I want to continue getting better at forever. It's right? it's a quest, man. It's a quest. It's a journey. It's a fantastic um, journey. And then the final question is, did they prove anything? You know, after you've looked at all this stuff, like, ask yourself that. Like, seriously, like, honestly, look at it and say, you know what? Okay, this their methods are tight. The, the 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 introduction is wonderful the, this discussion and, and limitation is interesting but i mean like what did they actually prove and this is where like talking about how do i how do i consume literature for my practice because that's really the position we're taking we're not talking about looking at this from a researcher's perspective or like you know looking to take an idea and slice it down to the infinite degree to find that one little minutia thing that no one ever did so you can have a justification to get published like that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about like you know is this practical or useful for me <laughs> You know, for me to actually do something with it. And did the thing that they did actually prove anything? And often than not, you'll find that, like, even if they prove their primary thesis or their main thesis, which is like, you know, some minutia little gap that they decided to identify, they didn't really prove that it does anything most of the time. Most of the time, you'll see that the limitations kind of undermine what you can actually do with this thing. And that ultimately, if you do decide to incorporate it in your practice, you also are engaging in something that I would coin, and I'm sure someone's called it this, translational practice, right? So then now it's not necessarily, it's evidence-based in terms that it's based on the foundational principles, first principles. It's based on something that did try this and did kind of prove it in some minute way, but it's not necessarily enumerated in a particular application. Um, and it's not necessarily been completely proved in such a way to where it was, it's a replication in practice and time. You're kind of freestyling a little bit based on the evidence that you have in front of you. And that's an acceptable thing though. That's an acceptable thing in the type of clinical settings that we work in and operate under. That's how doctors do it. Okay. That's how lawyers, lawyers practice the law. Doctors practice medicine. Behavior analysts practice behavior analysis. That's what we do. We practice it. You know, we don't execute on prescriptions or prescribed procedures or applications of what we do. Um, and that's what that's where taking us into like being a real professional and being like a master of your craft really transcends itself and really changes you into a different kind of professional and a different kind of level of implementer because you're not tied down to that, which actually brings us full circle back to the whole thesis of this conversation, the thesis of the podcast. Is there an article for that? And the answer is Mm -hmm. like, there doesn't necessarily need to be. (laughs) Okay. Like there's an article for almost everything at this point, or at least in some capacity of it. If there's a total blind spot, okay, I can assure you if you found it, hold on to that shit tight and roll in a doc program and go get famous. <laughs> okay. There is, uh, there is, there is some research that was done, uh, for the development of the food dudes program, developing e- healthy eating habits. And one of them was repeated tastings research, trying to see how many tastings of a new food item or a novel food item for someone does it take for them to start to, uh, generally move towards it and prefer it to some degree. And it was interesting because everyone's like, this research is fantastic. You're filling the gap. And I remember uh, Horn and Lowe, I was watching them speak somewhere, and they're just like, you know, this this actually was done in the early 1920s. But (laughs) 
when you're trying to to justify this in the modern day, people really want to see that it's still kind of held up and they want to see something more modern. Um, and it was this hat tip to like, y'all thought we found this. We didn't. We're just we're making sure it's still occurring yeah. <laughs> and asking some more new new novel questions with it. Um, it's fascinating, man. There's, there's, I, I've, there's, isn't there a saying around this? Like there's no, there's nothing, there's no novel ideas out there. Uh, what is it? I'm gonna look it up. Sorry. <clears throat> so anyway, there's a while great you're do- quote. To while you're violence. doing that, while you're doing that, there's there's one more thing that this kind of like circles back to, and it's and, and it's it really about where you look back to the where you look thing too, and another kind of strategy. Well, I guess uh, before I say that, let's just recap real quick. So first, so like, what's your kind of like, what is your like rules of thumb that you should follow? Number one, evaluate assumptions. Number two, what's the actual research question that's being asked? What's the actual uh, biases that are playing into it? What are their actual what what are their outside influences? Um, number three, look at the methods. Number four, really check out the graphs. Does the data match? Number five, check out the discussion and the limitations and like do those are those intellectually honest and do they represent what is actually in the results section? And uh, number number six or seven or whatever I lost track by now is <clears throat> did they actually prove anything? You know, go through that process and evaluate it. And if you if you follow that template at least you have a starting position and you have a good shot at making sure that you're you're using the literature and con- you're, you're 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 maximizing or at least on the on the quest of maximizing consumption in a way where you can actually use it in your practice but going back to um the who where what and like searching and kind of to your point about the food research thing is like you know like a controversial thing in our field and actually I, you know i'm conflicted on this <clears throat> um is like do you look outside of behavior analysis for some stuff you know oh yeah dude there's so you know, many disciplines out there you know that are doing amazing uh, work right neuroscience is crushing life yeah they are dude They're i crushing it. i um i won't i can't disclose all this yet but i locked in a video contract with someone that's doing behavior analysis and uh has a full-on neuro uh, department, mad cash, big stuff going on. I'm so stoked to just like go in there for a week and learn about how they're kind of bridging these together because I was taught to be so against the brain and so against those sort of things. Um, and then I was like in such an echo chamber behavior analysis that like realizing that there was value outside of things was really hard for me after grad school. Right. Um, and I made it a pretty, uh, publicly known thing that it's like behavior analysis plus something else. Like you gotta, like I needed to start moving, beyond like we have some valuable things we've learned but holy shit there's so much stuff out there oh dude there's i mean like even even i mean dude there's like some of the like diet research like some of the like nutrition research that's out there right physiological research kinesiological research medical research that like and honestly and even though and this is this is the this is the real controversial question some of the stuff in psychology now the real question that matters here Again, going back to that being a critical thinker, being a critical consumer, having philosophic doubt is and also being a knowledgeable, knowledgeable, like professional is never losing track of your foundations and your disciplinary assumptions mm-hmm. and also your non-negotiables. Right. My non-negotiables are radical behaviorism and functional contextualism. My non-negotiables are behavior. My non-negotiables are the operant. Right. But you also have to be careful where you put those walls up. Right. And how big those walls are. So that's where um, I was. It was, uh, I think, the acceptance commitment therapy boot camp in Orlando 2013 when when Steve was on stage and said something about like looking into other areas of psychology and they asked great research questions and I was like it was like one of those things where I was like I haven't really read anything outside of behavior analysis in the last two years during my grad program and I was like I'd put up these giant walls of like an echo chamber potentially and it was good for the time being in a sense of like I need to learn this sort of stuff and consume it but also it's like I didn't, I didn't necessarily realize how big that wall was that I built myself. Um, and yeah, man, I've, that's one reason things like this podcast or especially that why we do what we do. Like we did a topic on berserkers. We did a topic on like zombie ants. Like there's stuff that like, I'm like, how does this even relate to behavior of anything? Um, and it forces me to dive into research outside of those areas. And, um, the whole point of Steve's, uh, proposition was like, there are great questions out there. And how you're articulating on you need to have your non-negotiables and, and how you approach these things, you can interpret them in a totally different way. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, I yeah, think man. I saw you when you did that uh, when you were doing those lives, and Tom Buko was on that. Like, he, mm-hmm. you know, I really appreciated the perspective where it's like, you know, it's you just have to be able to interpret things through your lens so that you're not, you know muddied by the philosophic assumptions of someone else's position but it allows you to consume it in a way where it becomes valuable and useful uh and might take you down roads you hadn't previously examined because you're outside of the bubble you know because the behavior analytic bubble is real especially when you get when you get kind of restricted into the autism centric thing because even if you're trying to apply what we're doing to development of disabilities and autism which i work in that field i work in that that's my work you know what i mean i have found so much value in being able to integrate and amalgamate information from all kinds of different arenas and areas into what we do in through that lens, through our lens. And aside that, the, the, the creative solutions you come up with, the way that you're able to integrate information, the way you spit it out, and the way that you're able to be just be better at your job, you know what I mean, better at the work you're trying to accomplish, is yeah. really unbelievable. However, the danger there, if you're not careful, is getting sucked out of you know, your actual place where you should be living. And that's the, that's, that goes back to kind of some of the discussion we're talking about previous episodes where like, if you're not, if you don't have that anchor, you know what I mean? Maybe you shouldn't flirt with the dark side. Cause to me, that's potentially flirting with the dark side. <laughs> you know? um, but it's, it's really unbelievable stuff. Um, and that's why uh, I've hit on assumptions so hard is like knowing where your anchors are and assumptions is one of those for me is really important. I wanted to share one last thing, just a quick paragraph from this book. Uh, called From AI to Zeitgeist, a philosophical guide by, for the skeptical psychologist. N.H. Pronko, uh, really cool dude. There's one weird reference in here. Don't worry about it. Uh, knowing where it comes from, it's just another philosopher. So I'm going to quote real quick. Yeah, this is a, se- a section called How to Become Cognizant of One's Assumptions. I'm curious what you think about this process too, Dimitri. All right, so to begin. As a way of encouraging a greater awareness of the role that assumptions play in psychology, Van Kamm, 1970, page 28, suggested uh, suggests a certain program for advanced students of psychology. When they do their research work, students should state what their guiding assumptions are and what their results mean in the light of those assumptions. Then let them interpret the same results in terms of the assumptions that underlie a behavioristic, gestalt, or psychoanalytic approach. Such an exercise would parallel the case of uh, of a prosecutor of a criminal suddenly assigned to defend the same criminal. The lawyer in both situations must show flexibility and make the best possible case in either role. So with the students who so with the students who would be forced to be flexible in handling a given set of data under incompatible or even contradictory sets of assumptions over a period of time Such a program would lead to a universal awareness of the role of assumptions in psychology, replacing the almost universal contemporary denial of their existence. But there are other problems with assumptions, and he kind of moves on to that. Yeah, I mean, obviously not an empirical approach. No, it's a Socratic method. He's describing Socratic method, man. That's a it's a prosecutorial prosecutorial. That's not the word. Being a prosecutor, (laughs) I can't. I like it. I like it. It's being a prosecutor for an idea, man. It's putting it on trial. That's what we're talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. And like that, not being a dirty word or feeling icky, and and that's what we're getting at as far as like what critical thinking is, what consumption is, and that's that's the best analogy ever. I had no clue, but what Mark Malady and others around me at the time, my advisors were teaching me was how to start really doing this sort of thing, how to put it on trial, Um, and, and and doing that, and that's where, and that goes back to like. You know, when we're talking about dialectic and like when you're when you're talking with even other professionals and like having the metal and like having the thick enough skin to be able to talk to each other where you're putting each other's ideas on trial. You know, that's not a condemnation of a person. That's a condemnation of an idea. And it's not even a condemnation of an idea. It's it's a it's it's a trial of it. Is yeah. it can it withstand the assault of logic and reason and, you know, across other ideas and questions like if a thing can't stand up to questions, man, it's not an idea worth having. You know, and this is going to be the theme of the podcast forever now. <laughs> so people just need to get comfortable with it. But I mean, like, it, we're, it, science survives because it questions itself. And that's actually the, the, the next lesson um, where it's like, okay, you know, earnest self-criticism across an idea is, is absolutely necessary for this process. It absolutely is necessary. So, like, you even have to look inside yourself and say, okay, as I'm reading this, am I being too hard on it? You know, was that a fair question or now am I just like trying to go totally on the other direction and be ridiculously unreasonable, you know? Um, and 
there's a balance there to be struck. And I've, I personally, I can say I've played both roles. I have been absolutely so critical and unreasonable to the point where it's like I didn't want a thing to work. So I beat the living shit out of it in such a way where I demuned it. And I, you know what I mean? I made it impossible to actually be, to be workable. Um, <clears throat> but on the, on the other side of that, though, like, in my opinion, when you're just starting out, especially when we're just talking about reading for your own enrichment, like, it's better to be more heavy handed towards a thought than it is to not be. Because that at least will eliminate even questionable stuff and only leave you with meat and potatoes. And then once you have the meat and potatoes and you have a solid foundation, then you can slowly and slowly branch out a little bit better and a little bit more broadly so that you can uh, be more discriminative and discerning in terms of like what you're willing to bring into your framework that you're operating under, like the different informations that you want to springboard from when you're making decisions. So yeah, that's a, that's a great man. That's wonderful. I just literally, as we were talking, I just swiped on that book. So it's coming. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. You had a line in here somewhere talking about like the thresholds of evidence based and like these tiers. I thought that was something that was really interesting because uh, I at one point had no clue that there was kind of these tiers or different processes. I learned about um, uh, a clearinghouse and how there's like essentially certain entities that will try uh, themselves to sort out the research and figure out what really is working, what's not. One of them that I'm aware of is uh, the What Works Clearinghouse, which I will put a disclaimer out there if there is actual disagreement if they're going about it the best way. Um, but so I'm not like advocating for it, but it's one as an example. So if you just, just search uh, What Works Clearinghouse, it'll pull it up. And they have like these two tiers that they describe. Um, tier one is at least one finding shows strong evidence of its effectiveness. Tier two, at least one finding shows moderate evidence of its effectiveness. Um, and hold on, you can time out before you continue. Let's just talk about let's let's describe what this uh, you know what, what you're really what this means. Like what you're saying is that like there's different sciences, different disciplines have different thresholds for what they consider as evidence based. Is what he's talking about. So like mm -hmm. to be clear, like just because we as behavior analysts think that this thing is considered evidence based, you know. Or doesn't mean that necessarily say a psychologist would or doesn't necessarily say someone in education would because different types of disciplines have different now to be clear behavior analysis is in my opinion from what I understanding not my opinion from my understanding has the highest threshold for what is considered evidence-based versus say educational journals specifically actually which have a lower threshold for what's considered evidence -based. yeah so the one I gave an example of um, is the what works clearinghouse coming out of essentially trying to identify from an educational researcher's perspective, um, what studies meet the Every Student Succeeds Act. So there's a lot of convolution as to um, all of this, but what they did is they tried to set up was their strong evidence, meaning that it met um, their standards, there was a, uh, a statistically significant positive effect um, that's defined. There was at least 350 students, for example, um, was needed in this uh, tier one criteria, and that's where I was saying some people have issues with this because any single subject research would not meet their tier one as defined by having to need at least 350 students. So like these things aren't, I would say none of these things are perfect out there, um, but there's there's folks that are really trying to f focus on pulling this stuff apart for us um, and sorting it out. They're another good place to start. Um, but yeah, like there's, I can't remember the article right now, but there was a discussion back and forth, I think in the early 2000s, trying to sort out what we really mean as behavior analysts when we talk about evidence-based practice. And because um, surprise, we talked about it in different ways um, within our own field. Yeah. And, and again, like it, the different thresholds are, are they, they are not, they're not universal. They're just not. So like yeah. that, that's why personally, like when you read something, say from an education journal, like honestly, it, it, usually the impacts pretty high, but it's also lower threshold of evidence. So like technically what they're proving is a lot less impactful. And uh, what we pulled here from a resource is a science based medicine thing. Um, so like there's a and, and they give four different uh, criteria for something to be met in order to be considered compelling scientific evidence. So I figured we just like enumerate those two. And the first one is methodologically rigorous. Um, which means that it's if it's a group design, properly blinded, sufficiently powered studies uh, defined by control of relevant variables, and it survives peer review and 
post-publication analysis. Number two is there's positive results that are statistically and socially and statistically significant in a single subject to be socially significant. Uh, a reasonable signal to the noise ratio, so that's clinically significant for re- medical studies or generally within our ability to confidently detect. And that really just means that's more like does the data actually have what we're talking about pro- levels, differentiation, blah blah blah. And then is it independently reproducible? So like, can you repeat the experiment? Right? Does it meet the general scientific criteria of like yeah. repeatability um and those four things i think provide a nice framework too for like if you don't want to if the other subjective process that we describe is a personal exploration and a personal battle that you would have with something where you're trying to consume it what this is is more like okay as a reasonable person think this is science even if i disagree with the content of this like does it meet at least these basic criteria that are necessary for it to be like Okay, this is substance and evidence. This is evidence that's worth looking at and it actually matters to me. So there's a lot of different ways to go about um, evaluating evidence base. There's a lot of different ways in evaluating the literature base and all that stuff, um, which, again, goes back to do you need an article for that? <laughs> 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 you know, going back to the question. So what about – so what do you think, man? So now that we've, uh, we've evaluated all these different things, um, do you need an article for that? Uh, it depends. <laughs> I would say if you're if you're making a a very specific claim that's been researched extensively, then maybe there's some support that's needed there. But um, definitely not always. Definitely not always. Um, it really depends on your 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 assumptions and what you're stating and and what those premises are and your conclusions. Yeah, what's your goals? As yeah. Whether or not you really need one. Um, Man, yeah, man. We could have got. We have so many more questions we could have explored, like procedural, conceptual understanding, first principles, which we've kind of touched on. But I think we, uh, I think we beat this one up pretty good. I feel good about. Yeah, I want to. I want to see if I can eventually get uh, someone like Ed Morris on to talk about principles because that's just one that fascinates me all the time. There's principles of behavior that, to this date, no one has ever agreed upon. How are we a science of behavior and we have never, in documented like empirical conceptual journals books never agreed upon <laughs> we never agreed upon never i know that ed morris is working on a paper on this because it's one of those things where it's just like this is so ingrained into our culture of like you got to build it off the principles but don't we just... all agree on like selection by consequences well that's kind of uh yeah i guess the short that we'll leave people with is uh um because this is a big topic is there's kind of discussions that go about as to like should it be the things like reinforcement punishment extinction or should we go deeper and really look at the things that are that are in a sense uh composing those or affecting those so when you're talking about selection by consequences by directionality things like that those are I think the, the laws of thermodynamics sense. of behavior man that's the yeah that's the but, uh, mathematica Yeah, and so I think they're agreed upon in some small tribes, but in no way do we have cohesion across our field, and especially for someone uh, for a field that 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 touts these things so frequently. um, That's a publication opportunity to the max. Holy shit! Yeah, I think the problem. I I think the problem was it was just such a massive endeavor to be able to check all of the written work as to who stayed what was with you know on principles like i think it just turned into this massive research endeavor um or lit review endeavor yeah that's like Uh, the ultimate that's like the lit review to end all lit reviews (laughs) that's like yeah (laughs) read everything all right what's a law (laughs) (laughs) that's and that's where uh ed morris out of the university of kansas writes some great stuff and i know he was working on it um holy shit that's a lot of work yeah good luck buddy yeah it's amazing all right so marvelous (laughs) <laughs> marvelous marvelous that's where we are i guess is there any, anything else no man that's it we did it marvelous we're solid we did it marvelous all right y'all know what to do 